Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, I'm Chris Cooper. Each season has its benefits and challenges. Today, we're gonna to talk about avoiding problems in the fall garden. Also, once the fruit comes off the tree, what do you need to do to get the tree ready for fall and winter? That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Dr. Natalie Baumgartner. Glad Natalie to be is here. the Residential and Consumer Horticultural Specialist for UT Extension, and Mr. D is here. Glad to be here. All right. Thanks for joining us. All right, Natalie, let's talk a little bit about late season fall garden problems. <laughs> All right? So, what do you want to start off with? Well, we know we've been through the summer season, right? And we've dealt with some of the early blight and the common things that we see sometimes on our tomato plants and things like that. But I wanted to just talk about some things that maybe aren't as much okay. on right. our radar. Um, and basil downy mildew is one of the one of the first ones. This ha actually is a disease that we've been dealing with for less than 10 years right. here in the United States. Um, and it's something that can certainly take down our late summer to fall herbs mm -hmm. uh, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now what, what do the symptoms look like, though? I mean, how do you know that you have... Well, one of the confusing the things about basil downy mildew is when we first see it on our plants, we may actually mistake it for a nutritional issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, we're typically going to be looking at the top of our sure, plants and the sure. top of the leaves, and where <laughs> we'll see it first will be a little bit of yellowing between the veins on the top of the okay. leaves. We may look at that and think, oh, low iron or low nitrogen, right? right? right. We may think fertility. But what we'll want to make sure we do is flip over that leaf and look on the underneath side because lots of times then we'll see that sporulation, you know, that sign of the um, fungal-like organism that, uh, that causes this disease. And over time, it'll cause a lot worse damage um, on, our, on our basil leaves. Okay, so where does it come from? <laughs> well, it can be seed-borne, mm -hmm. and it's challenging con to control in, in basil. That Some seeds are treated, but that can be a potential entry source. Lots of times it's airborne, right. sure. uh, and you know it overwinters in very warm places. But as the season progresses, it moves uh, further up. Mm -hmm. And so if your if your neighbor has downy mildew on their basil, it won't be very long before it, before it gets to yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what are the most susceptible cultivars? Well, this is one of the challenging things about it because <laughs> right, we all That's like uh, Genovese basil, some of the sweet mm -hmm. basils for our pesto, and you know, to eat with our tomatoes and mozzarella cheese, and those are actually some of the most susceptible cultivars. Okay. And so um, there are, if we use a, a red basil or a cinnamon, Thai, a lot of those types of cultivars are actually less susceptible than okay. our sweet basil. Now we're making some good progress. Um, there are some. Sweet basil's Eleonora is one that has a little <laughs> bit more resistance uh, to basil downy mildew than some of our um, some of our other mm -hmm. older cultivars. Um, not bulletproof, not complete, but but will stand up a little bit stronger uh, to disease. So so we can purposefully choose another cultivar. We can watch our plants closely. Um, you know, high humidity, oh, of yeah. course. You know, we want good air movement. Sure. Um, and and watch them watch them closely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So treatments. Mm -hmm. You know, outside of what you just mentioned, if we do yeah. some of those things, but yes. any other treatments? So, of course, environmental is some of the best ways to deal with it. If we can, uh, of course, saying maintain low humidity in nah, the late summer that. is a hard thing yeah, to do. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Um, <laughs> but uh, good air movement, you know, not letting our plants get so dense with <laughs> leaves. Um, so keep them harvested, keep them, watch, watch them closely. And if you have a few infected leaves, pull those off mm -hmm. quickly. And... Uh, and try to you know maintain as much uh, sanitation as possible. Keep those um, clean. There are some um, some biological sprays like Actinovate, things like that mm -hmm. that are you know organically certifiable that we can use as a protectant. Okay. You know as home as homeowners there aren't um, fungicides that work real well for control, but when we have high humidity um, temperatures and things that are you know very ripe for infection, then mm -hmm. some of the protectants can 
can be a good step. <laughs> okay, yeah, always practice good sanitation though. So yeah. I tell folks, get those infected leaves out of there. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move to army worms, right? <laughs> yeah. That's a problem? Okay. Yeah, so I'm sure that people are probably pretty familiar with fall yeah, army fall, worms. Yeah, right. um, One of the issues that I've had in, actually, it's been my tomato uh, plots and trials this summer have actually been yellow striped army worms. So they're mm -hmm. very, so they're mm -hmm. very close, um, but, uh, but, you know, can be foliage mm -hmm. feeders. Uh, but I've actually had um, a lot of uh, issues with them feeding on the fruit. How about that? Okay. And and as you know, you can guess. Certainly, they'll damage the fruit. But after they feed for for a little while, then you get um, other you know disease mm -hmm. and, and degradation that can really really destroy those fruits. We want to catch them early. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what does that damage look like? Well, it'll actually um, on the fruit. It'll right, kind of look fruit. like a little circular entry hole. So they'll okay. be feeding on there and in very advanced stages I've actually um, you know found them completing the rest of their life cycle to get back to moths right so they're right. going to be small moths wow. um, inside inside that tomato fruit so okay. sanitation can be good right sanitation, if we, that's right if we um, find fruit that we know that they are feeding on and potentially occupying we want to get that <laughs> out of there so they don't you know become moths in multiple generations right so the more we can right. um, control what's currently infecting our plants the more we can um, Stop it. So, Mr. D is going to like this. So, <laughs> is that fruit still edible? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if you catch it early, yeah. I guess what do we say? There might be some extra protein. Yeah, protein. See, that's protein. what he said, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Extra protein. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes there'll be a little surface feeding that you can work yeah. around, but if they're very far tunneling in there, lots of times you'll get some, some decay okay. in there. Okay. Yeah, so I've sprayed um, with BT products, BT, sure. right? So a zero-day pre-harvest animal, you know, you can spray that. Yeah. Easy to get a hold of. Thuricide, Dipel yeah. would be a couple of brand names. Some of the spinosad uh, products, okay. and certainly, you know, conventional insecticides, but they may have a, a longer window before you before you can eat. Okay, mm -hmm. good deal. Now let's get to these squash bugs. You know, <laughs> this is a problem. You know, we get the question all the time in the office about squash bugs. Your yeah. experience. Well, and I think with squash bugs, lots of times we get to the latter part of the season. I, I mean, I've had them on my, my winter squash. Mm. Um, pumpkins tend to be the cucurbits that they like the best, and we have lots of large adult populations. And by the time we've gotten here, our chances for control are harder, right? Yeah, it's much harder to control definitely. the adults. So what we really want to be doing is being aware, knowing, okay. what, the, uh, knowing what the eggs look like, you mm -hmm. know, looking on the underside of our leaves and being prepared uh, for those infestations mm -hmm. uh, before they occur. Some people will put boards out in their garden, you know, they like cover and yeah. they can then squish them in the morning. So it's a, I mean, it's a <laughs> right. good way to start your day, <laughs> right? right? right. Yeah. Kill some squash yeah. bugs and head off to work. Um, right. So early control, knowing, right. um, knowing what, you, what you have and treating those um, with, and much of this might be a regular insecticide uh, spray because okay. by the time our vines start to die down and there's not as much for them to feed mm -hmm. on they're much more likely to start feeding on our fruit damaging yeah. them and reducing their their storage life so okay. we want to watch out for the little ones before the uh, before the adults get much harder to control and I'll tell you what those eggs look just like little bronze footballs yes yeah and, just, and you, uh, once you've learned what you're looking for yeah. They're very characteristic, and and in a small garden, you know, raised bed or a container, just just squ squish yeah. or pull the pull the eggs off, and you can really reduce your populations in small gardens. Mm -hmm. I tell you, at our victory garden, uh, the ladies out there, you know, Miss Stephanie, Miss Twilight, they actually, you know, wrap tape, mm -hmm. you know, around their hand, and they, you know, of course, flip the leaf over, and they actually, <laughs> that's how they get rid of the squash bug eggs with the tape, and it actually adheres, it sticks take to the tape. Take them out that way, yeah, and yeah. they just squish them. Yeah, yeah. take. All, all of those, that whole mass with them. Yeah, yeah. so it, it works for them pretty good. It's a lot right. safer than using two bricks for the adults. <laughs> <laughs> Teach your thumbs and yeah, call yeah. Them. It's painful. Yeah, those things yeah. can be something else. Yep, get them young. Those adults are hard to control. All right, now we appreciate that good information. Thank all you much. Right. Thanks, right. All right. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. Hi, Mr. Day. Fall fruit tree care. What do we need to be doing? Uh, harvesting. If you have <laughs> yeah. apples and it's a little early on pears, or my pears anyway, are not quite ready yet. 
but uh, uh, you need to, if you still have fruit on the trees and you've been following a cover spray program, you need to continue that until the uh, pre-harvest mm -hmm. delay that is on the insect, uh, the label. Uh, you need to be sure you follow the label where that's concerned. Uh, control weeds, uh, yeah. this is a good time to, to, you know, you don't want grass and, uh, you know, up around the base of your, your fruit trees. Uh, I like bare ground. Mm -hmm. And I used, you know, there's some good products out there. What's the Thoxidem Post is, mm -hmm. is Post. a real good grass material. And, and um, uh, you know, I try to get bare ground out under the drip line of my trees. And I, bare ground gives up ground heat a lot easier in the wintertime than, than ground that's covered with grass or weeds or mulch. mulch right. so, so I think that's a real good thing to do. If you've already harvested and some of the earlier varieties were through harvesting, uh, make sure you don't, if you have mummies on that tree, get the mummies off and get rid of them. Don't just toss them away. You know, you want to get rid of that short because they can be a source of infection, you know, mm -hmm. next year for, for uh, fungal diseases. And if you have, you know, fruit on the ground, do the mm -hmm. same thing, you know, get, get that out of there and get it completely out, you know, double bag it in a plastic <laughs> bag and, you know, take, send it to the landfill. Don't put it in your, your yeah, compost. compost pile, yeah. you know, uh, you know, get it, get it out of the, out of the area. Um, so, you know, those are some things that you can do. Uh, this is a good time actually to do a soil test. Hmm. Uh, it's not a good time to put fertilizer out, but it is a good time to uh, put lime out if you need it. And most fruit trees need a pH of, you know, 6 to 6.5. Okay. So this is a good time to pull that soil sample and you can lime any time that needs, liming is needed. Um, the earlier the better because it takes a while for lime to actually change the pH mm -hmm. of the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, do not, I certainly wouldn't put fertilizer out this time of the year. It's a little late for that. Uh, you don't want to encourage young tender growth because, you know, when you have a cold snap that can create yeah. problems that can kill, kill uh, Plants not a good time to prune. Um, we we want to wait and do our pruning, you know, late winter mm -hmm. uh, on the fruit trees, and uh, uh, that's you know pretty much it. Uh, weed control, uh, continue insect and disease control practices. Uh, uh, follow the label, and mm -hmm. you know don't don't uh, put these products out right as you're picking them. If and, and, and you know, just be sure be sure you follow the label there. Let me ask you this, uh, Mr. D. So if you had a blight, you know, this year, what can you do con to control that for next year? Uh, and you know, you're talking to somebody that I've got that on my apple trees. Right. I've got, I've I've got, got on my fungal yeah, disease. Tree. And, and I'm just going to do a better job next year yeah. of following. Uh, I'm, I have to put them on a home orchard spray schedule. I'll follow the, the, the UT home orchard spray guide to mm -hmm. the letter. And and, and you know, it's you're basically talking about every seven to, t to 10 days if you want clean, you know, fruit. Now, I, I don't have any worms. I don't have any insect damage to speak of other. I do have a stink bug, a lot of stink bug damage. I don't have any yeah. caterpillar right. damage, right. I can say that. But I've got a lot of stink bug injury. So if, if I had followed a regular spray program this year, my trees are really young. This is really the first year that I had a crop off of them. Okay. And, and um, I, I just, didn't I had more fruit than I thought I was going to have, and, and even, with young trees, you're really supposed to keep them for, free of insects and diseases. Some of these fungal diseases thrive on the leaves and stems and, and all that, and not even if you don't have fruit. But uh, I need to practice what I preach, and <laughs> so I'm going to do a better job next year. I'm going to get rid of those mummies, get them, get them out of the way, and and I mean I've done everything else. Uh, I did. I actually did a, a good. Uh, 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 dormant spray last year with okay. oil and uh, uh, liquid lime sulfur and uh, those kind of things. I, did, yeah. I started out right, but then I just I got yeah, busy. Got it's busy. been a really yeah. busy yeah. summer, yeah. Yeah. and uh, and I'm I'm talking about. I think I have five apple trees and a couple of pear trees. Is uh, you know so I. Uh, that's pretty I'm good. Gonna, I'm just going to do a better job next year than I did this year. What about you? You say you've got some problems. Did you? Yeah, follow you know, I, have, I have a peach tree and a pear tree. It's like you know I start off. You know, pretty good like you did, mm -hmm. but then you know when you go through the season, you get busy and it's. Eh. It's really it's really hard. I mean, with a cover a spray, wet. when you do a cover spray, uh, we've had a lot of wet weather. You yes, know, this, we have. This August uh, and, and uh, late July and August, and and if you were putting a protective cover spray out there, if it rains, it washes it off, right. and you've got to go back and do it again. And if you wait a couple of days. Uh, you know, you have already opened your, mm -hmm. your fruit up for infection. And, and if it rains every day, yeah. like it has done, you yeah. know, there's absolutely no way to keep that protective coat on there. So it can be a little frustrating. 
but you just do the best you can do, and uh, um, uh, sometimes you're going to hit a home run, you know. <laughs> yeah, no home run. And, and you realize <laughs> the thing that's really, uh, it really hits you, you know, is you realize these commercial folks, it really makes you appreciate what oh, the yeah, commercial I folks do. are doing, do. what they're having to go through, because, you know, Mother Nature is a, a variable out there that you that's can't right. really control. That's you right. can control water, you know, you can control some of it, right. but uh, uh, you really can't control Mother Nature. Okay. Uh, so the fall is also a good time to plant fruit trees, right? Right, right. Okay. And, you know, I actually prefer planting them in late winter. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, but you can plant them in the fall, fall okay. of the year. Uh, but uh, I prefer planting them about the time, about pruning time, you know, okay. prior to, you know, February and, 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 and May. Of course, you you avoid, by planting them in the fall, you avoid sticking them out there and getting a real hard freeze mm -hmm. within 48 hours. It really causes problems. So, so if you've got a lot, I mean, uh, but if you've just got a few, go in and order them now. That's the thing to do. Get on, get in the catalog. Yeah, decide what you want. Yeah. Choose your varieties. Go on and place the order. Right. And and uh, some of those real popular varieties, it's hard to get. They go quick. Mm -hmm. You're right. Sometimes yeah. they may sell out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And I got to the point now. I always look for resistant varieties now. Yeah. If I can find them. That's why I don't have any peach or plum trees, mm, you know, yeah. because I've not found any that are resistant to plum curcuteo <laughs> or brown rot. Uh -uh. And I've had that. I've been down that road. When I lived down in Mobile, I had uh, peach trees and, uh, you know, just uh, and I tried and tried. And it's just really, really hard to get a he healthy crop of peaches off of mm -hmm. home, home. Trust country. me, I, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fight that battle. Well, once every four or five years just isn't quite rewarding enough. Mm, right. So yeah. Before we have to leave, Mr. D, any, any insect pests that may be causing problems late in the year that you know of? Uh, stink bugs stink are bugs, still okay. working on, on uh, you know, your fruit, and but it's really, really hard to control them. I mean, um, uh, but, but yeah, they are a problem, and you can always tell where they've been feeding. Yeah. They, yeah. You know, they, inject that substance in and then pull it out and wherever they inject that that substance it really creates problems in the fruit. All right. Well, we appreciate that information, Mr. D. Thank you Thanks. much. Yeah. What I have here is a homemade uh, T post extender. It's made to exceed the uh, height of the T post. So I made an extender to go on top of the T post with hose drilled about eight inches apart would be fine, uh, a quarter inch hose, and then I loop a uh, wire through them so that uh, when I tie them up, they, the strings will not slide down. Take one of the holes in the bottom and put a bolt in it, and that will keep it from sliding down on the post. They're very easy to install. They just slide over the top. Now this one's gonna fit a little snug because the T-post is a little bit bigger than normal, but there, it's down to the bolt. The bolt will keep it from sliding down. Now what you have to do is tie it to the post. And that's the purpose of the loop. Okay, now when we get to the top, it's gonna to be about nine feet high. I use a salvage pool ladder that uh, has legs that are flared on them. So if you're using them in the garden, it doesn't sink into the ground like a regular ladder will. Very simple, it works great, and uh, lasts a lifetime. All right, here's our Q&A session. Natalie, you jump in and help us out, all right? All right. All right, here's our first viewer email. Does it hurt the production of tomatoes if you get fungicide spray on the flowers? Mm -hmm. Hmm, how about that question? Well, that I, that's before. an interesting that's question. Interesting I mean, question. I guess there are a couple of ways to look at it. I mean, one thing that I would want to throw in there is that tomatoes are self-pollinated. Mm -hmm. So if you're worried about a spray that could it, um, you know, injure pollinating insects is not as much of a concern. Mm. Um, you know, but they are self-pollinated, so we do, you know, need the pollen to, you know, move a right, short sure. distance oh, there on that flower. Yeah. So if right. you're absolutely spraying right on your flower and really <laughs> getting the, the pollen wet, I guess it could, but it doesn't strike me as a, as a real serious concern. What? No, no, what I, would, I, would not, yeah. I would not think it would be a problem, no. especially if you're putting it out at the labeled rate. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're talking about, uh, now, if you stand there and you spray and spray and spray and spray and spray, <laughs> you can actually drown them, I guess. Right. Yeah. The water would do you as much as yeah. right. the fungicide. Yeah, it, yeah, it would yeah. be yeah. more of the, the water, but... Um, this has been my experience that the fungicides do more good than harm. Right. I've sprayed them during bloom, and, and it prevents the early blight and late blight sure. and, and all these, these blights yeah. on tomatoes. And, 
I've never had a problem with the fungicide killing a, a bloom. We want to apply anything. well on our leaves, yeah. and really, we, we shouldn't be applying a lot on, you know, right. shouldn't be much on the flowers. That's yeah. right. Okay. All right, thank you much. Here's our next viewer email. Is it too late to plant sweet potatoes? And this is from Joe. So, yeah. now, is it too late? Well, to Joe, it potatoes? takes about 100 to 140 days <laughs> right. to bring a to sweet potato, you know, all the way through its life and production cycle. So, for this year, yeah, yeah. But you, oh. but you could be ready for, uh, for next year. Of course, they're very frost sensitive. Uh, crop. So even with the long growing season mm. here in... Uh, Unless you have a greenhouse. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Heated I greenhouse. should. I should make caveats, right? <laughs> yeah. if this is a regular outdoor plot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's, a, it's a little late. I mean, they are the the often one of the latest things that go into sure. our garden, but uh, we're here at the end of uh, yeah, it's way yeah, too late. Yeah, way too late. Mm -hmm. Way too late. Mm -hmm. All right, there you have it, Joe. Way too late. Sorry about that. We'll get an early start next year. You'll yeah. be all right. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have a tulip poplar tree. A few years ago, black spots began showing on the leaves. They return every year. I think I see them again this year. Why does my tulip poplar always get black spots on the leaves? And this is from Paul M. Bartlett. So black spots on the leaves, uh, you know, it'd be good to actually see that. Uh, but when I think of tulip poplar, you know what I think of? Two things. I think of aphids and I think of scales. Right. Which makes me... Think of a honeydew. Think of honeydew. Mm -hmm. And when and you think of honeydew. Right. Yeah. 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 So, me too. That's what I... Yeah. That's what you think? That's what I think. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably what it is. So yeah, black spots on leaves. That's the first mm -hmm. thing I thought of. Yeah. Hmm. So what do you think he needs to do for that? You know, how big is this tulip poplar tree? Yeah. I, you know, uh, you know, they're not. It's not going to kill the tree. It can be unsightly, and and uh, you know, you can treat the scales when the crawlers are active, and that's in the fall, I think, mm -hmm. is when tulip poplar scales mm -hmm. are active. They're a large, soft-bodied scale insect. But if it's a real large tree, if it's a small specimen tree, then you can try to control the scale with a with a sprayer. But if it's a big, tall tree. Uh, it's not going to kill the tree. No. You can take a hose in sprayer with some detergent and watch the sooty mold off. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, the sooty mold is not taking anything out of that tree. Right, right. It's simply using that leaf as a, as a, you know, a place to to be, yeah. and it's uh, utilizing sunlight. And yeah, blocking a little bit of light. Blocking, yeah, blocking, blocking photosynthesis. Yeah. Yeah. Right, definitely right. doing that. Yeah, right. shading it out. But um, that's what I think is probably. Yeah, the that's what I think it is. Yeah, and there's some systemics mm -hmm. that you can use if it's a real big tree. It's our control. Yeah, you, you know, can do some that. of those aphids or scales. You can, you can yeah. do that. Yeah, you can do that. So, yeah, you have it, Mr. Paul. It's not a big problem, but it's, it's something we definitely see uh, a lot with tulip poplar, right. which is the state tree. That's right. It yeah, it's the state tree. That's right. All right. So, here's our next viewer email When is the best time to plant strawberries for next year? What do y'all think about that one? <laughs> Natalie's like, hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want strawberries, I mean, really bearing for mm. next year, I mean, the, the time is the time would be now. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can go even in October. Yeah. Maybe, okay, September and October. Yeah. Are really but if they haven't them. ordered them, yeah, right, you better, yeah, you better things like that. And uh, and that's you know I, I I know you can go matted row and and you can plant them even with matted row you can plant them in the fall and the spring. Mm -hmm or the spring, but I, you know, if you plant them this fall and, you know, you may have to do a little frost protection. Right. Yeah. You, know, you have to cover them up a yeah. little bit. Warm but, but man, you will have some nice strawberries. Yeah. Wow. So it would be good if you can get it. Yeah. yeah you've yeah. gotten yeah. them in the ground already. May yeah. and, yeah. yeah. Or at least on the way. Well, on the way, right, right, right. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Definitely be thinking about preparing that ground and getting yep. ready there. And certainly. Get the pH right. And, yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, you're right about the frost damage. That's something I forgot all about. But, but I mean, but they harden. You know, you let them harden off. You don't have to protect them all winter long. Okay, so it's not all winter. When you get ready, what does it take? Thirty days from bloom to har to ripe fruit. So whenever you you just decide when you want to start eating strawberries, and, and you back up back. thirty yeah, days, and then you start protecting <laughs> right. them next, you know, next uh, spring. Okay. Yeah, uh, and of course, with the fall establishment, you'll need to be more careful with moisture and yeah, and things yeah. like that. Getting them, getting them in well. It'd be yeah. nice to have some drip irrigation. Yes. It'd be yeah. really nice to yeah. be able to irrigate because October is normally our driest month, mm -hmm. and uh, so if you have a way right. to irrigate a little yeah. bit, that'd be good. Keep the leaves dry and keep the plants healthy and in good shape going into the winter. Mm -hmm. And there'll be good strawberries for next year, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Natalie, and Mr. D, we're out of time. Right. Thank you much. Thanks a lot. Remember, we love to hear from you. 
send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. If you want more information on taking care of your garden or fruit trees this fall, go to familyplotgarden.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.